I don't, I don't know how you feel about it, but there's nothing like worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. For reverent and beautiful worship. And I thank God that that's one of the hallmarks of who we are as a body of Christ. On this Young Adult Sunday, I've been listening to and trying to be obedient to God to speak a word that is relevant with specificity to our young adult Christians, but to all of us in general. I know many of you were not here in the previous services, so I'm going to quickly suggest that the heart of the message that has already been delivered from the Lord is that in order for you to grow in grace and graduate in the things of God, every now and then God has got to break up relationships with people you've been accustomed to for a long time. That the truth be told, my brother and my sisters, there's no way for you to graduate and grow in God and just be in relationship with anybody and everybody. The closer you get to God, the more difficult it ought be to maintain relationship with some people. And you go through seasons of life when the Lord intentionally begins to disturb and destroy even the relationships that we've made in life. We looked at Gideon and his journey and how the Lord declares, I break you up for four reasons. Some people around you are not properly prepared. They've got the right look, but the wrong spirit. As I break you up to teach you the power of prayer because we have a tendency of becoming dependent upon people more than we are in prayer unto God. That when all holy heck breaks loose, you run to friends before you fall on your knees. The Lord says, I get rid of some people to protect my praise because some people's presence in your life is a threat to the glory that God wants to get out of you and that there's some who literally are in a relationship that is not mutually beneficial. You have people around you who are just quenching their thirst from you but adding nothing to your life. My God. Um, and then finally, I suggest that God remove some people from our lives that we might know the power of his presence. For the truth be told, God says to Gideon what God says to you and me, as long as I'm with you, you really don't need anybody else. If you got to do it all alone, you've got to believe that God is sufficient. It's in line with that message of breaking up and editing associations, filtering friends and changing relationship that I want you to join in with me and some more practical word from God about how we handle these matters. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bible to the book of Genesis. I pray that you have no difficulty <laughs> finding the book of Genesis. In the 13th chapter of the book of Genesis, there's a word from the Lord that I think is appropriate for teaching on the heels of a message about breaking up. Genesis, the 13th chapter. I want to read out of the New King James Version, beginning in verse number one. The Bible records, then Abram went up from Egypt. He and his wife, Lot, he and his wife, excuse me, and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. Mm -hmm. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Yeah, right. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Watch these words. Please separate from me. 
if you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere and before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated from each other. All right. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look toward from the pl and look from the place where you are, northern, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. I want to put a tag on this teaching today, talk about what to do when it's over. You may be seated in the presence of God. What to do when it's over. It was one of the greatest religious minds of the 20th century, the great mystic and theologian Howard Thurman, who said, that in life there are but two critical questions one must always answer. No matter who you are, no matter where you are in life, there are two critical questions you must ask of yourself and answer. Where am I going? And who's going with me? The great theologian Howard Thurman says that you must first identify the destiny of your life. What is your goal? What is your purpose? What is the aim of your life? What are you trying to achieve and accomplish? JT, he suggested that equally as important as knowing the destination of your life, the dreams of your life, God's plan for your life, it is equally important that you be clear about who's going with you. For if the truth be told, you can connect yourself in relationships that ultimately hinder you from the destination God has declared over your life. It is Greg Hawkins in his book Reveal that suggests that one of the things that keeps people of God out of their God-given destinies are inappropriate relationships that tie us in ungodly places. Where are you going? And who's going with you? If the truth be told, your associations and relationships speak more to the character of who you are than your words. If you really want to know who somebody is, don't ask them who they are. Look at who they hang with. For I was taught that association breeds assimilation. Okay, you, you didn't get it like that? Birds of a feather flock together. Big Mama said, if you lay down with dogs, you'll get up with fleas. That who you are connected to can either help or hurt you, can either launch or limit you, can either push you or prohibit you. And every now and then, God sees that we have a proclivity to attach ourselves to people who are not helping us become what he desires us to be. As I said, the first two sermons, that Lottie Dottie and everybody ain't qualified to stand with you. That there are some people whose presence in your life is absolutely counterproductive to the purpose and plan God has for you. And in those moments, the Lord has a way of breaking up 
relationships. The problem with many of us is that we choose and tend to hold on to people who we know. God says ain't part of the plan. They didn't audition. I didn't give them a role. Didn't cast them in the script of your life. But you hold on to folk that you know God says got to go. But let me tell you how good God is. God loves you so much that God's not going to allow you to miss your destiny. So when you refuse to let go, hear me, my brother, my sister, God will allow some controversy, some conflict, and even something crazy to go down to push you to a place where you let go. If you don't get it by revelation, you will get it through struggle. And if you are unwilling to release, God will let it get crazy and deranged until you decide, I got to let go. The Lord has a way of using controversy and conflict as a tool to separate us from those who really don't belong in our lives. Right. If in you don't believe that, then you haven't read Genesis 13. Genesis 13 is a story of this man named Abram who will eventually become Abraham. And just a little while before chapter 13, God woke Abram up in the middle of the night and told him to leave from his father's house. Abram wants to know where he's going. God says, don't worry about that. Walk by faith and I will show you where I want you to go. Don't, don't miss this. I'm not telling you now, but when you demonstrate you've got faith in me, when you progress a little ways down the road, I will then reveal to you where I want you to go. And the Bible says that Abram got up, grabbed his wife, his possessions, and told his nephew Lot to come with him. Abram, Sarah, Lot, and his family leave from his father's house. Bob says that one day while they're journeying, they get to this land and the favor of God is upon Abram. His flocks are multiplying. And God favors Abram so well that Lot gets blessed from being in the presence. Lot's flock begins to grow. And they reach the outskirts of Canaan where their two herds have grown so large that a problem arises. They are both so blessed that they can't occupy the same space at the same time. And the Bible says that their servants begin to fight one another. Turns into the Hatfields and the McCoys. Abram's folk versus Lot's folk and they're fighting over the land that they're in. I, I need you to see that the controversy comes because God has blessed Abram and he's in the place God tells him to be and because of the favor and the call on Abram's lot on Abram's life strife breaks out with Lot that ultimately leads to their parting ways. D don't miss this. The strife comes because God has called and favored Abram and the call and favor on his life ultimately leads to the separation between Abram and Lot. Okay, third time's charm. Th they break up 
Because God has called and God has favored Abram and the call on Abram and the favor of God ultimately lead to the necessity of a separation. Because when God has called you and when God has favored you, there is no way to walk in the favor of God and still be connected to everybody. See, you had it twisted. You thought the call of God and the favor of God would draw people to your life. But the biblical reality is that the favor of God and the call of God oftentimes have to walk away from folk that we've been in relation with. Oh, teach pastor. Uh, I prepared for y'all to be quiet today. They're called, and the favor leads to separation. Now, now, why Lot? Judy, I could not figure out for the life of me why the Lord allows a situation to come up that causes Lot and Abram to separate. We, we don't read anything about Lot that shows he's got the wrong spirit or the wrong character. But I finally figured out why Lot had to go. Can I share with you why? Because the Bible says in chapter 12, when God called Abram, watch this when you go home, read it. God calls Abram. And the Bible says, Abram departed as the Lord spoke to him. And Lot went with him. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Rewind, you, you missed it. It's so simple, it's profound. God spoke to Abraham and Lot went with him. Okay, you, you. God called Abram and Lot went with him. <laughs> you, you, you still ain't catch. The Lord spoke to Abram and Lot tagged along. The fundamental problem was that Lot was never assigned to Abram's life. Abram allowed Lot to be in his life. You, 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 you just missed it because there's some people who do not have a godly assignment but they are allowed by you in their life. Watch this, this gets deep because all Lot could offer was companionship but not partnership. Okay. Come, come, come on, come on, come on. Let's get deep. The reality is that there are some people in our lives simply because you don't like being alone. And so you allow people who can offer you companionship, but they had no godly assignment to bring a partnership to help you on the journey of where the Lord has called you. And God says at some moment, I got to break up your companionship because they are not a partner. God, I feel like preaching now. And one of the greatest life lessons you've got to learn in your young adult years is how to be alone. Can I preach that? God, I feel that right there. You got to learn to enjoy the company of me, myself, and I. You got to stop being so desperate to have companionship that you allow some jive turkeys who ain't got no godly sense about them to be connected in your life because you don't know how to be a girl. Go to the movies by yourself. Send yourself some flowers. Go out to dinner by yourself and enjoy yourself. If you cannot enjoy the company of yourself, you will allow lots in your life. Well, the Lord says, I got to break you up from. And sometimes it's got to get crazy to get you out. 
please tweet that sometimes. God's got to let it get crazy to get you out. A problem arises between Lot and Abram, and there is no happy medium. There's no compromise. There's no solution that works. Because every now and then, God will allow a strife and a controversy to come that you can't repair. Something you can't get over. You can forgive, but you can't go back. It has become an irreconcilable difference. What do you do when it's clear that it's over? What do you do in a relationship that seemed right a little while ago, God won't allow any longer? How do you handle it when it's time to break up? Does somebody tell me, I'm glad I'm at church today. I'm... Somebody said, Reverend, I didn't know how you knew I was going to be here, but you're talking to me right now. This text teaches us some things you've got to do when it's over. Now, now you're not going to like all of it. And I can't, I can't even shout it. I'm just going to drop it on your lap and let the Lord apply it to your life. Can, can, can I tell you the first thing you've got to do when it's over? This, this tough, this tough. You've got to be the peacemaker. We don't like hearing that. Because I like doing unto others <laughs> as they've done unto me. And it is our natural tendency to want to fight fire with fire. But what I see here in Abram is a brother who realizes there's a problem and the Bible says in verse 8 that it was Abram that goes to Lot. Not Lot who goes to Abram. They both know there's a problem. But somebody has to initiate the peace. Somebody's got to say we need to resolve this. Somebody has to take the initiative of making it better. I know you don't want to hear this, but the Bible says in Matthew 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Hear me, my brother and my sister, in contentious relationships, it comes to an end. Your responsibility as a child of God is to take the high road. Now, now, can we be real for a minute? Can, can you take your sanctified mask off for a minute? And can we be honest? It ain't easy taking the high road. No, it, it, it's not fun taking the high road with somebody that's in the gutter. It's not easy staying committed to the godly way when somebody is playing by any means necessary. It's not easy staying in the right place with God when somebody is using demonic tactics to try to bring you down. But the word of God through Abram is you stay on the high road and you do what you know God has called you to do and you stand in the holy place because the minute you leave the high road, you rob yourself of the ability of God fighting for you. Wow. Come, come here. If you want the Lord to fight this battle, and if you want the Lord to lead you, if you want God to resolve it, you got to stand in the right place. Yeah. Wow. That's good we, we always tell folk, if God is on your side, it'll work out. How do you know God is on your side? I can tell you the real easy answer when you're on God's side. <laughs> I'm sorry, that, that was too simple. Um, you know God is on your side when you're standing on God's side. And as difficult as it may be, you've got to take the high road. You've got to be a peacemaker. Here's what Paul says, uh, when you got enemies, 
Pour some love on their head. Treat them with grace and dignity. Respect and love them. And watch how it upsets them that they cannot agitate you. They cannot control you. They cannot pull you off of your godly place. You are so committed to the ways of God that it doesn't matter what you say, what name you call me, what lie you use. I am committed to being the peacemaker. You know somebody tell me you got to be the peacemaker? Abram goes to Lot it says we got to work this out because it doesn't have to get ugly. He says there doesn't have to be strife between us. And in order for that to work, you've got to be committed to not wanting it to get ugly. Now, let me tell you what, well, that's a challenge for your neighbor. Because you've got a neighbor on your pew who can only function in ugly. They don't know how to talk without cussing. Don't look at nobody, that ain't even right. But some people can only function in dysfunctionality. Lord says, no, no, I, I need you to be the one that says it doesn't have to get ugly. And you show a weakness when you allow somebody else's ugly to make you ugly. <laughs> God, I, I'm, I'm preaching to myself this morning. I, amen, Pastor, amen. <laughs> so, so Lord says by Abram, number one, you, you, you got to be the peacemaker. Take the high road. Number two, though, when it's over, you can't be afraid of a difficult conversation. God, okay, can I hang out here for a moment? Abram doesn't ignore the problem. He doesn't pretend like it doesn't exist. He doesn't hope that it'll go away. He goes to Lot and says, we need to talk about something. You may not like the conversation. You may not want to hear what I have to say. It may irritate you, and I can't be afraid of how you're going to respond. There are some things that must be said. My brothers and sisters, so many of us stay in ugly situations that God is calling us out of because you are afraid of a difficult conversation. Somebody on your pew right now is frustrated and fed up, angry and anxious, confused and conflicted, all because you don't want to have a difficult conversation. You don't want to talk about something that's touchy. You don't want to say something they may not want to hear. You don't want to upset them because he's crazy and deranged and may fly off at the hands at a handle and so you're biting your lips you're monitoring your words and you're sitting back in silent frustration I'm of the mindset my brothers and my sisters that it is better to have a difficult conversation than to suffer in silence and one of the things I believe God has pressed upon me to press upon you is to raise a generation of Christians that are courageous and are not afraid to speak the truth in love. That no God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and a power and a sign, sound mind. Stop being scared to express yourself. What kind of relationship are you in if you can't be honest? If you've got to lie about how you feel for fear of how they're going to respond. Can I, can I drop three biblical truths on you? And I, I, you know, I, I'm not even going to try to holler. Them. I ain't got no story. I ain't no joke. I'm just going to give you three biblical truths that I want you to tweet. You ready? First one is this. Avoidance ain't deliverance. And simply because you avoid something doesn't mean you're being delivered from it. That there comes a moment when you got to address it, when you got to step in it. Look, I, let me go get them. You got to put on your big girl drawers. You got to put on your boots. You got to step in the middle of that situation and you got to identify it and talk to it. You got to be real. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, Deacon Johns. I, the, the deacons, I'm sorry, y'all. No, you just got to deal with it. Because avoidance is not deliverance. Can I give you number two biblical truth? Avoidance ain't deliverance. Number two, bad news don't get better with time. Bad news does not get better with time. And so you're biting your tongue thinking that the longer you wait, the easier to be to say it. When there's sometimes you got to realize that you just got to say what needs to be said because no matter how long you wait, it's going to be bad. My, my dad put it to me like this. Uh, well, I ain't going to say you what he said because I already said draws and I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I ain't gonna tell you what, the way he said, I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a, I'm a paraphrase it. He said, son, if the doctor tells you he gotta cut your finger off, do you want him to do it one inch at a time or just cut it all off at once? No, I, I think just take it all at once. Because there's some things you just have to do and get over with. A good friend of mine told me the key to walking through hell is keep walking. <laughs> if you're in it, keep walking till you get out of it. Don't stop. Keep walking. Deliverance, avoidance ain't deliverance. Bad news don't get better with time. Can't be the third biblical truth. You can't take authority over what you won't name. If you can't identify it, you'll never take authority over it. God tells Adam, you have dominion over all the earth, but you got to name everything first. Because if you don't name it, you can't take authority over it. So at some moment, you got to open your mouth. At some moment, you've got to speak what's on your heart. You have to say what you feel. You have to talk about what happened. You have to stop avoiding it. You can no longer be afraid of it. You have to address it. You have to look it in the eye and deal with it. Because you can't avoid a difficult conversation. I, I remember when, uh, when uh, Cooper uh, became a toddler, right, right when we moved here. Um, and maybe, maybe it's about three. Uh, no, he's about two, going, going on two. And um, I found out, and I say this to, to parents, uh, when your child moves from baby food to real food, <laughs> their diaper changes. <laughs> no, 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 no. Some parents just say, man, you, you, from baby food to real food? And so Cooper was a toddler, and he had on a pull-up, and, and you know, I, it ain't nothing worse than a nasty pull-up. <laughs> Diapers are easy. Pull-ups are disgusting. <laughs> and Cooper had on a nasty pull-up. So, so we're sitting in the living room, and he waddles in. Because, <laughs> you know, they walk differently. <laughs> and... It's obvious from his walk and the smell in the room, he got on a nasty pull-up. He walks by me and I look at him and smell him. I looked over to Debbie and she smelled him, but we both sat there. I didn't move because I was hoping <laughs> she was going to get up <laughs> and change his pull-up. So he walks around, he just walked around the room and we both sitting there like, And after a few moments, I just said, at some moment, somebody got to deal with this mess. Like, it's offending both of us, and we both acting like it ain't what it is, because nobody wants to deal with it. But at some moment, somebody's got to be mature enough and Christ-like enough to acknowledge that there's some mess in the room, and somebody has to deal with it. Because you can't be afraid of a difficult conversation, you've got to be the peacemaker. Can, can give you the third thing, and, and you know what? We may not even shout. I just want to make sure you get it. You got to be clear 
on what victory is. What do you really want as it's over? One of the things that allows us to go down peacefully between Abram and Lot is that Abram knew what he really wanted. The problem with so many people, when it's over, is that they're not clear on what it means to win. You're going to walk away hurt. You can't avoid taking an L. So what do you really want? If you're not clear on what victory is, two things will happen. Number one is that you'll fight for the wrong things. And some things ain't worth fighting for. Number two is that you'll continue to engage even after you've already gotten what you want. There are so many people in life who are addicted to fighting that they will engage you even after it's an appropriate time to just walk away. So until you know that you've gotten what you are clear that you want, you'll allow them to engage you in another battle, another round, another argument, another fight, because you're not clear on what you really want. Here's what Abram says. He says, Lot, I've been thinking about this. And we got a problem we can't resolve. But I tell you what, all I want is to be at peace. Let me tell you something, you know you're done when you don't care about the land. All you want is the peace. Because when, when, when you get old enough, you realize there's nothing more valuable than peace. <laughs> There's nothing as important as just laying your head down at night and going to sleep. If I got to do it on a park bench, just let me be at peace. More important than the cattle and the land was Abram saying, I just want peace. So here's what Abram does. He says, Lot, you choose what you want. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you want the right, I'll go to the left. Just please separate from me. That, 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 that's all I'm asking. Let's bring an end to the strife. If you want this, I'll take that. If you want that, I'll take this. I'm not fighting you over the stuff. You can choose what you want. It is pride that keeps us from letting someone choose what they want. Because you don't want to look like the sucker in this. You don't want to look like the one that was taken advantage of. You don't want to be the loser in this. But there comes a point where you don't care about that stuff. You care about being at peace. Somebody say, I know that's right. So, so watch how the story ends, Judy. Th this blows my mind. Lot looks out that way and that way. He says, you know what? Over there looks a whole lot better. That's the plain of Zoar and them beautiful twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Wish I had some Bible readers. And that looks good over there. So I'm going that way. And Abram says, fine, take that. I'll go over here. And the Bible says that after Lot left, that's when God said, now here's the plan I have from you. Don't forget this. God didn't tell him where he was going when Lot was with him. But when they separated and Abram took the high road and Abram was the peacemaker, God said, now here's the blessing I have for you. that I know the separating hurt, but there's life on the other side. There's a blessing on the other side. There's more for you on the other side. And the Lord separated and blessed Abram 
because he knew what to do when it was over. I wish I could tell you that everyone with you now will be with you forever, but God breaks us up. And when God does, you've got to be the peacemaker. You can't be afraid of a difficult conversation. And you have to be clear on what you want and let peace be more valuable than anything else you can grab a hold of.